Welcome to Good Game, your no BS insights for crypto founders. I always consider ZK as a Web3 technology, which some people disagree with, They're saying, no, that's a general technology. It was existed before way Web3. I think most of the interesting advantages in ZK happened when you actually started monetizing this technology, yeah. right? Yeah. And people started, oh, there is money to be made in here. So let's develop this yeah. further, right? Yeah, I think like crypto used to be like, oh, about privacy and stuff. And then the word crypto got like taken away from the cryptographers and, and crypto meant like, oh, blockchain, right? But with the ZK stuff, like I think the word crypto kind of got back into where it belongs. Looking for your next startup idea in crypto? Check out our request for startups list and get inspired at alliance.xyz forward slash ideas. Welcome to Good Game. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, zero knowledge proofs and some of the startups and ideas that we're seeing that could be brought to the market and some of the ideas that we think could be brought to the market in the next couple of years. We have David again from our team that's joining us along with Buddha and Chow. And so maybe I'll throw out a question to you guys, which is, what are zero knowledge proofs? And I know we've talked about this previously in, in some of our past episodes, but those that are you know newly tuning in, what are zero knowledge proofs and what do you think can bring to the market? Oh, we're getting right in. No, uh... Right in. No chit chats. No yeah. chit chat. Unless you want to do some chit chat, I'm I'm also open to that idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, zero knowledge proofs. Succinctly, a zero knowledge proof is the ability to say a fact about something that you know without revealing the fact itself and being able to convince another person that you know the fact. Let that sink in a little bit, right? <laughs> um, at first. It seems kind of impossible, but there are actually a lot of easy ways to uh, that you can see out there in, in the world out there. Sorry, why is this such a big problem to solve? Because, it, you know, obviously it took decades of research to get to where we are today with zero knowledge proofs. So why is this such a big deal? It's a big deal because it's a technology that allows a symmetry between an attacker and a defender, you know? Mm -hmm. So like there's a lot of technologies prior to this that are not asymmetric, right? Like you, you discover fire, you discover guns, and then like, it's very easy to destroy. Whereas like, this is one of the technologies that allow you to defend yeah. easier than, than to attack, right? And that's what makes it exciting. Yeah, I yeah. can add some color to that. Like the concept is not really new. The concept has been around, like that you can do encryption to hide some information and like only one person will know. And the zero knowledge proof is that the concept of it as... David said is that you can do something that is have private information, but the proof is public. So like anyone can prove in public what you know in private. And this is a different concept. Uh, encryption doesn't do that. Um, on the technology development side, there was actually versions older than what we know in 2016, Zcash. But there are some features that were very new. These features are something like in non-interactivity. What is that? Like, you can prove something like that, like a zero knowledge, if you are interactive. I ask a question, you answer this question. I ask another question, you answer again. So this requires interaction between us. So, and this can be done mathematically, and but it requires both parties to be online at the same time. The new concept that came with Zcash is a non-interactive component that you don't, we don't have to interact. We don't have to keep communicating. So this non-interactive part was interesting because you can do the proof separately. And then I can verify it later without us communicating at all. So this took a lot of kind of moon math to achieve. The other advantage I would say is that finding new ways to make this computationally possible. You can do this by many computations um, that will take a lot of computing power, a lot of time. The trick here is to make these computations smaller in size more suitable for consumer hardware for random for people like us who have like desktops or whatever to can do it so i think this is what made it like mm -hmm. take a long time to develop and funnily enough like most of the development having in the last i would say five years or like now eight years since 2016. <laughs> do we want to go down the rabbit hole of the moon math behind it well i think the moon math is uh is definitely beyond the scope of this podcast Okay. And my knowledge, I don't even know how to do it. But like, I, can... I think the best guy to touch on the math is like our mathematician, uh, Chow. Chow. <laughs> it's an, it, it was an LU for Chow. We did examples of like ZK proofs like, without the math, right? Just like to show the, what the concepts are. 
And for that, I have prepared some slides. So, okay, let's, let's do it. So I think the most simple to understand is the, the Alibaba cave. Okay, so this is the slide uh, that shows um, the Alibaba cave example. The problem setup goes like this. Peggy wants to prove to Victor that Peggy knows the, uh, the secret code to this magic door, right? So if you know the secret code of this magic door, the magic door can open. Um, but if you don't, then it, it just does not open, right? But, and, and Peggy wants to show that, sorry, Peggy wants to show Victor that she knows the, the code without revealing the code. So a zero knowledge proof of, of how this could happen is for Peggy to go into this cave. And, and this cave has this, uh, uh, two paths that are connected by the magic door. And Peggy will choose either A or B and get stuck behind one of these paths. And then, and then shout out to Victor, Hey, like you can come in. And then Victor would, would come into to this area. And then Victor would say, uh, please come out from path A or please come out from path B. And since Peggy knows the code, she can, uh, go through the magic door and come out either by path A or path B. But if Peggy did not know the code to the magic door, then Peggy would, you know, can only come out of either path A or path B, the one that she initially committed to. So this is an example of a CK proof. And what a CK proof does is three things. The first is if the person who knows the thing actually does know the thing, then they can like always produce a the, like the correct answer, as in like come out from A or B, whatever Victor chooses. If Peggy does not know the thing, then she cannot lie. She she will get caught at some point, right? And lastly, uh, nothing is revealed to Victor. Like Victor doesn't know what the magic code is. So this is like a very simple example of a of a zk proof. And if if you do this multiple many 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 times, then the the chances that Peggy would never get caught if she does not know the, the, the code, you know, approaches one, right? So you actually brought up a really interesting point, which uh, people don't usually talk about, which is that the zero knowledge proof is actually a probabilistic proof. You, you can, there is a small chance that you can cheat and provide the right proof. But uh, if you do this long enough and as uh, often enough, then uh, at some point you're going to fail. Right. And you know you can generate a random hash and and land on somebody's uh somebody's Private. stash Private, of, yeah. of Bitcoin yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So actually, I like I have a fun aside here. Do you know why you are called Biggie and Victor, <laughs> especially for you, Imran? I don't know. Why? Actually. <laughs> okay, mathematicians are nerds, right? So like they want to use real names that relates to the actual thing. So Biggie starts with a P for prover. Vector oh starts with a V for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, welcome to the nerd board, you guys. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, that's great. So we have an, like a high level understanding of like what this could enable, right? You know, being able to share information without revealing the underlying data, right? What are things that it can enable? Like, what what are we thinking about here in terms of startups? Well. I think, like, do you want to talk about how we went from this sort of basic thing to something that's more general? Yeah, yeah, maybe general, and then we could talk about what it can bring out to the market. Right. Yeah, so that example was a very specific ZK proof. And for a long time, we didn't have a general way to, to be able to prove any statement about the world. So the for a long time, the holy grail was to be able to prove, like, with any function f, like I know something that goes into the function f that produces this output y for any f, right? And I guess for a long time, well, okay. So at some point, they 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 found a a problem that's NP complete called like the the, the R one CS the rank one constraint system it's of, of polynomials. David, you, you were debating in your head whether or not you should go into this <laughs> NP problem. <laughs> I, I can tell why you hesitated. Uh, this is a whole new rabbit hole. <laughs> like, that's sorry, a rabbit go hole. Ahead. We're going to jump through because because I don't I can't explain it well enough. But there is this set of problems called uh, the the rank one constraint system. It's like a polynomial where you have to like find integer um, solutions to it in like a mod prime 
field. I- Imran is lost, <laughs> but go ahead. I, I'm still following so far. Uh, I, I, I'm lost. I, I, I read this and it took me a while to like understand what is the field actually to begin with and like what's the movie field. Like, so like, <laughs> like, or, like he's like probably Imran and like anyone like who's like, what the heck is that? <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to show like a visual, uh, just a visual, right? Visuals not, are great. This is first year um, honor grad math course, by the way. Yeah, sure so enough. this is a rank one. Uh, constraint system. So you have you have these x's that add together to get other things. You have some some you can multiply them to get some other things. And all these things are are integers in uh, in some uh, that are smaller than some uh, p, which is a prime. And you know in practice it looks you know some something like that. You know you have these lots of x's and they they add up and they multiply and they they equal to other things. So that's just how it looks, right? It doesn't matter. Um, Imran but, was hoping for a visualization, but you give him a bunch of. You <laughs> <laughs> made it worse, David. Visualization, yeah. No, this was. I mean, I got, I got the concept, but uh, yeah, it was. It's still like still Imran, like, like what? Trying to just to shake your confidence, like you understand <laughs> <laughs> this stuff, like so. Yeah. So that it, it just, it just turns out that this problem. I mean, this uh, function has nice properties that we're not going to go into. Mm-hmm. And people can prove, they have a way to prove that they know a solution to this without revealing what the solution actually is. And it turns out that this problem is NP-complete and every other NP-complete problem can be translated into this one. So that's why this is, this is useful because you can translate any sort of function that you want to come up with. There's like an easy way to translate to this problem. And then this problem has a way to generate a, a ZK proof. So can I can I try to rephrase this in a like more yeah. high language? So the idea here is that you can take a general problem that you need to prove, right? Like running a code. If you are running a code, how can you prove that this code has run, right, or not? That's a really hard problem. So the trick actually, or the magic trick, is to convert this general kind of problem into a mathematical representation that you can actually work on paper to find the solution. So what the R1CS system is, it's a mathematical representation that can be solved mathematically to show that we have good probability that I can do something without cheating, right? The trick here is that this R1CS is so easy that you can actually convert it, convert any problem to it. You can prove that you have run some code by representing it in R1CS. You can prove identity which is harder to prove, but you can convert it again to R1CS. And once you get there, the rest is just math. So the trick is this conversion step. Is that accurate enough, David? <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's like different ways of converting a general problem to this R1CS. And I think I think those are called like arithmetizations. And that's why like you'll see in like ZK proving systems, there's like different languages and different arithmetizations and like there's and they all have different properties that ultimately will you might have to like balance out when building an app you know yeah just for completeness here like r1cs was kind of one of the first but now actually major protocols don't use it anymore uh like there is starting uses something like called air representation air arithmetization uh ethereum for the data blobs will use something uh, called kzg so like there are different approaches of this, but our one CS was kind of the first or like the easiest to start with. I suppose it's probably not clear enough what our one CS is to, to most mm-hmm. of the audience. Is it a polynomial function that you can solve? Yes. Okay. I think most people understand polynomials, right? Or no? I'm uh, sure. Or we can go d- deeper into that. But, you know, before we go to polynomials, you know, we need to like bring it down a little bit lower, right? Uh, in regards to what uh, R it was RC one S R one R one C R one C S. See, I don't even know it. See, <laughs> um, so I probably represent the average audience. So let's just put it that way. So is this the the math behind what makes zero knowledge proofs work? Is that the idea? Yeah. Okay. And why is this important now? Uh, why are we discussing this now? Is this like are we laying down the the uh, foundation for what types of math we're using moving forward? or how we prove out different uh, systems like on Ethereum and, and others? 
it's actually maybe good to go slightly into history, like why yeah. this actually came to this space. And I think most people were initially interested in the privacy aspect of this kind of math that you can prove something without revealing it. And mm-hmm. the first actually project that got used that it was Zcash, right? Mm-hmm. Zcash wanted to implement private payments using blockchain. Blockchains are great. Bitcoin was great, but everything is transparent. Everyone sees that this address sends this address this amount, yeah. right? And this is necessary for the network as a whole to come to consensus that this person actually has amount of money so they can s- spend it to someone else. So all of a sudden, like the idea of zero knowledge to prove that you have some asset and you can spend it without revealing how much asset do you have or without even revealing who do you spend, who, who are you sending this amount to or even without revealing how much money you will send. Are you sending the whole balance, half of it, a part of it? So Zcash came with this idea that you can prove some computation. This computation, I have 100 tokens. I want to spend 50 to another address without anyone on the network knowing what the details. But everyone can know one fact, that this transaction is valid, that I had this balance. I can spend part of it and I can send it to this address. So that is the story that what started actually brought this moon math into our world, which is blockchain. That you can prove this computation without revealing the details. And Zcash actually started with, with that. And from there, that opens the door so may, so to so many applications after that. Like we will probably dive into this application in detail, but the most major application now by far is rollups. Yeah. Which for the fun of it doesn't use any privacy. <laughs> so like, it's at all. It's, it's, you don't use privacy. But we are seeing more applications that use privacy, like identity and like bridges and stuff like that. So we will touch on that. But I just wanted to give a brief history why we yeah. care for that. Okay, David, uh-huh. you, you can go. Yeah. Another thing to add is that, uh, you know, in 2016, when Zcash came along, they had to improve and, and build the tools and do some math to even be able to get this into production. And over the years, as these tools and, and things got more standardized, like it is now like kind of possible for generalists like me to do something with ZK. You know, like maybe even one or two years ago, there wouldn't have been the tools for me to come in and do anything with it. So that's why it's uh, interesting now because mo- like more and more people, like uh, exponentially more people can actually uh, play around with these tools. So would it be fair actually to say that Web3 or crypto led actually to the development of ZK? Absolutely, yeah. It's a lot of like the, you know, the blockchain uses that, that pushed the development of this stuff. So because I always consider ZK as a Web3 technology, which some people disagree with, They're saying, no, that's a general technology. It was existed before way Web3. I think most of the interesting advantages in ZK happened when you actually started monetizing this technology, yeah. right? Yeah. And people started, oh, there is money to be made in here. So let's develop this yeah. further, right? Yeah. I think like crypto used to be like, oh, about uh, privacy and stuff. And then the word crypto got like taken away from the cryptographers and, and crypto meant like, oh, blockchain, right? But with the ZK stuff, like, I think the word crypto kind of got back into where it belongs. Very interesting, yeah. I feel like a lot <laughs> of the funding also helped, right? So uh, VC funding into like Starkware and others that helped push the development of some of the ZK proving systems, uh, starting with ZK, Zcash. Mm-hmm. So I remember vaguely like there was a, a, a really intense debate on Twitter when people called it like crypto Twitter. And people like were like cryptographers were like really offended by saying that crypto is not <laughs> is not a word for like shit coins. It's a word for cryptography, which is a, like a very disciplined science. Like that is only like being done in like prestigious schools like Harvard and like MIT and <laughs> stuff like that. So David, so uh, about what you said earlier, I that sometime during the last one or two years, people finally are able to do something with this technology. Generalists are finally able to do something with this technology. I've observed two trends. One is that people are overestimating how much you can do now because everyone just slaps the word ZK into their project nowadays. Nowadays, it's all ZK and AI. Like It's ridiculous. So number one, people are, are overestimating how much you can do with ZK. But two, people are underestimating how fast the rate of change is happening in, in the ZK space. 
because one or two years ago, this thing was not even possible for a generalist. But now you can do stuff with it. You can build some basic identity stuff. So the thing I'm most curious about is what is the actual current state of things? What is practical today? What is realistic today? Yeah. So I just、uh, came back from a class offered by、uh, Zero X Park, and I'm definitely not at the forefront at, of, of this technology, but I can. Give like some. I can repeat some of the statements they had. So, in terms of optimism, right? One number they gave was that this stuff was improving at like thirty to sixty four x per year. So, you know, every year you would be able to do create、um, zk proofs that are sixty four times bigger. You know, and and that has been happening for the last four or five years, and that's like an extremely fast rate of improvement. But at the same time, this rate of improvement is—it's really at the edge. Like people are working on things like zk ML. You know, that's like a lot of computation to put into a zk proof. But it's like for very specific things, and and they have to like do a lot of research and optimize like problem specific optimizations just to get that thing working. So the progress is not is not uniform. You can't you can't summarize all of it in like one number, right? And there's like different dimensions in which it. Which you characterize zk proofs too, like there's the time it takes to generate the proof, or the time it takes to to verify the proof, the memory, the memory size, and like the proof size, and all these things will have to be balanced in order to fit like your applications. For example, if you want your proof to be verified on chain, it has to be small enough, it has to be it has to run fast enough. But if you don't need that, then you can like you know. Have those things be bigger, but like have the prover be run faster. So if it's like a in browser application, right? So should we kind of dive deeper into the proving types of proving systems that are available that give you the trade offs that you know builders need? Like there's you know Airstark, Pickles, Starks. Yeah, to to be honest, I like I don't have a good sense of what are the trade offs that each proving system will, will give. Okay,、uh, but I, I can give an example of something that seems. Easy, but turns out to be pretty hard. So let's say I want to prove that I own an address on Ethereum that is part of a group, right? So you know, with a with a normal computer, you do that in like milliseconds, right? You say like you you generate a a private key, you get the, the the address out of it, and then you check if that address is part of this group. It takes like one millisecond. I don't know something like that, right? But Right now, the fastest way to do that takes around forty seconds on consumer hardware, like on my laptop. You mean、uh, proving that you your address belongs to a certain a list of addresses without revealing your address itself? This thing using zkp takes forty seconds to generate the proof. That's right, and and that's like the optimized, and that's like stuff that came out within the last year, right? Okay, so. This is what we call inclusion proof that your proof is it,、uh, that your address is part of a group or included in a group. Is that is that correct? You can call it inclusion proof. I don't mind. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Like ah,、uh, like list. So just to prove something simple as that, like that my address maybe owns like a、uh, an ape. <laughs> like you can do this very quickly if、okay. everything is transparent and you don't need to prove it. But if you want to prove it, then you it will take. A while, right? You have a list of all the addresses who have an ape, and you don't want to reveal your address, but you just want to prove that you have an ape. Right, right. So this task alone will take forty seconds to prove. How much、right. time will it take to verify on a chain if you want to verify it? Much faster, like on the order of a, a second or something on consumer hardware. Not, I think less than a second in、uh, on consumer hardware. So one of the application of this. So if you've heard of a、uh, noun DAO, right? One of their Funded apps、uh, is called a Hey a Noun, and what you can do is like if you own one of these Noun NFTs, you're able to post a message into that forum anonymously. So like on your computer, you will generate a proof that you belong to that group, and the server will like nobody else will know who posted that that message, but it will be posted on on Hey a Noun, and the group that enabled this as a is Persona Labs. And they're the one that really like optimized this specific、uh, zk proof, right? Okay. And it takes forty seconds. 
on a consumer computer. Okay, there's a there's a there's a, a pop, uh, little start here. <laughs> so it takes forty seconds if uh, if the group of addresses have never sent a transaction. So it turns out like if you want to prove that uh, your public key belongs to a group of addresses, like Ethereum addresses, it takes forty seconds. But if you want to prove that your public key is belongs to a group of private of of, uh, of public keys, not addresses, public keys. Then it takes about four seconds. Okay, so the first time, kind of, to post a message is like forty seconds because you are proving that your address is part of the larger Ethereum set or Ethereum address set of Ethereum addresses. But next time, second time, because you already published something on this high announcement, it takes only four seconds because you just need to prove that you are one of these private keys, right? Oh, sorry. Uh, so there's a difference. There's a difference between an address and a public, public key. key. Okay. Because yeah. like. Once you've posted a transaction, then your public key becomes is revealed to the world, and it just turns out that the math, the zk math bet- that translates between a public key and an address, just takes a lot more work. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of hard. Like if you, as a, as an outsider, it's it's like hard to tell what is going to take a lot of time, right? Because like all of the inclusion and the and the elliptic curve stuff takes. Four seconds, and then you have like that other thirty-six seconds that are that's just to turn the public key into an address. So I can give a little bit more light into that. Actually, some of the operations that can be done very, very easily on hardware are really, really hard to do in zk, and the opposite is true. So, for example, multiplication and uh, addition. This used to be kind of complex for hardware. Hardware can take a, a little bit of time to do. But in ZK math, multiplication and additions are a piece of cake. Like you really can do it very quickly. Something like that can be done very efficiently in um, in hardware are logic operations and or the XORs. You know this, uh, Chow, right? This like when you take single bits and then you add and do an and or, or logical operation on them. These bitwise operations are really efficient in hardware, but they are really, really annoying <laughs> when you want to do as zero knowledge proofs. They on, can when, you say, when you say hardware, do you mean something like ASIC, FPGA, or? Even single transistor, you, like single transistors, like not even, you don't need a very complicated circuit to do this bitwise operation, and then ORs are literally gates. So this is a very simple primitive hardware, and an OR. And they are the most efficient com- element that you can do in hardware, but to prove them in ZK math, it takes a lot of effort and time, and like really takes a lot of computation. and Back to David's point, there are simple operations that you can do in in compute that you say, oh, this will be easy to do in ZK. It's not. Like, ZK is very good for multiplication and addition, really bad for other stuff. Digital signature, for example, when you sign a message on Ethereum or Bitcoin, depending on the type of digital signature, this digital signature can be efficient for ZK or not. And this is actually one of the areas that have evolved a lot over the last few years. Yeah, it's... Ultimately, like the, the hash function that Ethereum chose uh, at the beginning turned out to not be ZK friendly, right? Yeah. The, the hash it chose is the, the Ketchak 256, it's like the weirdest word. Uh, but, it's, but because Ethereum was built, you know, prior to all this ZK stuff, you know, it turned out to be a, like a bad hash function for ZK. Just to give like a, like an order of magnitude of how much it, it takes from like normal computation to like ZK computation. The number that I kind of hear is on the low end, it's about 100,000 X. And on the high end, it's like 100 million X. <laughs> so yeah, you, you give an example. You said like, if you want to do what I call the inclusion in mm-hmm. set proof in computation, that's like will take one millisecond. But if you are doing in ZK, it takes 40 seconds. So divide 40 seconds by 1 millisecond, that's a 40,000 multiplier, right? Uh-huh. And that's like on the low end because it was... It Optimized. Was, yeah. Okay. On the, on the high end, you have like these general, like, like these general naive translation of, 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 um, of general com- compute to uh, ZK compute. Then you get like this 100 million X, right? Wait, so, so speaking of the, uh, computational efficiency, does it even make sense to build hardware accelerators for ZK proofs today? 
Because what I'm hearing is zero knowledge proofs are extremely specialized today. Like they, they you need to tweak that that proof for a specific problem. But then if you try to build a hardware accelerator, can it even be generalizable enough? Am I thinking this right? Like, is this a, a, a right problem to think about or, or no? So definitely not a specialist. In general, like getting things into the GPU, which is like a general uh, compute, will give you like an, uh, like an, a speed up of 100x. And mm -hmm. it's not like 100x is not, uh, does not solve everything. So there still needs to be like algorithmic improvements to get things working. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a 100x get that you can get at some point whenever you know you feel like investing the time in. <laughs> so, like hardware is my specialty, so like I can kind of dive deeper into that. So, zero knowledge proofs are like have to be optimized on both software and hardware. So, I would just software is what people are doing. So, Branova, all these people are optimizing really the software and the libraries, uh, how to build libraries that are fast. On the hardware, like it boils down that. This old proofing systems that people are creating since growth 16 and like the, even the new ones like stars and halo or whatever like that and plonk and all this algorithm depend on two basic mathematical operations. One is called numerical, uh, theoretical numerical transfer or like, or people call it fully transfer. Uh, that's to make it simple, fast fully transform. And the other one is called multi-scalar multiplication, MSMs. So, there are, let's say there are two operations. One, like, uh, like these two operations can be actually really optimized by hardware because you need, uh, especially for Fourier for transform, they can be parallelized. You can have multiple components, more components do the same thing. In a GPU, you have some of them, you have maybe 100, but in a specialized ISIC, you can put a thousand on the same chip area. So you can actually have more of the components you need and have less of the components you don't need often. So the whole idea about acceleration is that on the hardware level, you don't put everything. You don't put a general processor. You don't put even a GPU. You just put specialized hardware component from the components that you need the most. And this tend to be like for transforming engines and memory. You need for, for, for proofing systems, you need a ton of memory. You need like terabytes of memory sometimes. See, so if you create a, spe a specific ASIC or like a specialized ASIC for proofs, you can have a lot of memory and a lot of FFT engine that can give you between a 10x to 100x. But given that threshold that or the barriers that we need to climb, it's the barrier in, in, in David's term is four orders of magnitude, 10,000 times, or as maybe you said 100,000, right, David? So that's five orders of magnitude. So from five orders of magnitude, you can take only two orders by hardware. You still have three orders of magnitude or a thousand multiplier that you need to figure out by other methods, which is software optimization, improving the algorithm itself, stuff like that. So maybe going back to your nouns DAO idea where they're verifying identity. So it seems like this is primarily a gateway for proving identity without revealing either your assets, your net worth. What are some of the applications do you think that could come out of identity, ZK identity? And I know Chao always threw out the, the startup, which is like a Tinder for net worth. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it, yeah. Um, and so maybe we can um, talk about, you know, uh, I think we could dive deep into many areas, but the first one I think is identity, which I think could be pretty big. Uh, KYC ML for, for exchanges is an example, you know, Tinder for net worth, et cetera. Uh -huh. Yeah, so the way you would do Tinder with net worth, with, uh, with crypto net worth, right? Right now, you would like gather all of the addresses that have a uh, high net worth and you just build a list and anybody could verify that. You could say like, okay, yeah, check this address, look at their on-chain assets, has like a million dollars. I don't know if that's enough for you, you know, one million. Uh, <laughs> and you know, you can prove, you can, you can generate a ZK proof that uh, you own this address. And that would be where you would send that to your, to your match on Tinder and be like, Hey, look, I'm rich. <laughs> Okay, so but this method in this method you you, you precompile a list of high net worth addresses and then you prove that you belong to that address. What about an alternative way where you prove you just look at the the balance in this address and try to prove that this balance is above certain threshold? Is that even practical, realistic today? Ah, uh, so that goes into like zk EVMs or like state proving. So there's like um, there's a startup called Synced. No, sorry. 
uh, Axiom, Axiom.xyz, that wants to generate ZK proofs on any state of any function on any state of uh, an EVM. And do they do this automatically, or is this? What do you mean by automatically? <laughs> Meaning, like, do they precompile all of the state that's ready within Axiom? So, like, if somebody wants to pull some data, it's already readily available. No, it's you have to. Right now, you probably have to like work with them to write some sort of proof for it. Okay. They have actually a public demo on their website that you can prove some features, like the age of the address. Like, is this is this address new? Has it transacted since like one year, five years? So they have actually implemented a circuit that can prove that using from the uh, maybe also how much you transact or how much you want something like that, but like. It's not general yet. You cannot prove everything that you, you cannot get an arbitrary proof for whatever function you need. There is specific. There's still some work that needs to be done to get there. Yeah. Yeah. They're making it easier. Yeah. They're making it easier for, for somebody to come in and like take a new state and use that as a proof. Yeah. Do you have a sense of how long it takes to generate that proof? The one that like the way, uh, you said about proving net worth. Um, the the axiom, the axiom way. Mm-hmm. And also the your, your way, which is checking that right. an address belongs to a list. Right. So checking an address uh, we talked about earlier, which is either four seconds or 40 seconds on consumer hardware. Mm-hmm. Once you have compiled the list. So, you know, you have to like, somebody has to like compile the list first. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other way, I, I don't have a, I can't say what. So, what it's so like, like for, for that part, they do the proof on their servers and you have only, an, you can do only an ABI call to their server. So like you can get a response within like maybe 30 seconds, but you, that's not a clear indication of how much of that's actually the time they use to do, to generate the proof, but it gives you an upper limit. Like it's mo- not more than 30, not more than 30 seconds. It's a, sm- it's a simple proof kind of. For identity proofs, you don't need to tr- generate the proof on a continuous basis. You just need to prove it once because it's, an identity and it rarely changes, right? Unlike the ZK rollup stuff where you have to generate proofs upon every block and, and shit like that. With identity, even if it takes 40 seconds to generate the proof, it's not that bad from a consumer point of view, right? It depends. So like if you want the messages that you sign to be signed with your identity, with your group identity, then you need you do need to make a proof every time. Because like if you just make a proof once, Somebody could intercept that proof and reuse it to say like, oh, I am part of this group. So in practice, you, you do need to like sign new messages with that group identity to... Uh, to so there's I, also I a time it, component. There's mm-hmm. a time component. You need to prove that you belong to that group at this point in time. Yeah. But five seconds later, things could change completely. So yeah, okay, you're right. Yeah. Uh, it's a bad experience. 40 seconds to generate a proof. It's a long it's time, not a yeah. good experience. But like just to... To give context, like when Zcash started, for you to send an a simple transaction, like just as a shielded transaction back then, it took actually sixty seconds on your computer to generate the signature. Yeah. But with some improvement on the hash functions uh, and the proofing mechanism, they got to this to two seconds, right? So like this kind of uh, to David's point, like you can actually improve like by forty x or fifty x or what in one year. So. Yes, what can take 40 seconds this year, maybe be couple, become a couple seconds yeah. in a couple of years. It's not out of the realm of possibilities. And, and I would say that like most addresses have sent out a transaction. So like you can use the, the other version, the public key version of the, that group inclusion algorithm, which is like four seconds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So identity is one. What are some others? And uh, I know we, we, yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of a list that we made, but like, I'm curious on like so some of the. Let's start with the list and then maybe yeah, select yeah. a few to discuss. Like, so yeah. most, as we mentioned, the most obvious application is rollups, but actually let's generalize rollups of a chain compute that you can take the compute that you are doing today on a chain, which costs a lot of gas and uh, a lot of congestion on a chain and take all of this compute and execute it off a chain and then generate a proof for this of chain compute and bring a, only and validate only the proof on a chain. So I would say off a chain compute is um, is one big one. Similar to that is or like a subset of that is actually bridging between different blockchains, uh, which people call state proofs. State proofs that I will prove that the state of blockchain one 
and generate a proof of it and validate this proof on blockchain B and then or two and then I can actually spend this or wrap or create a wrap token that represents whatever happened on block. So and think sovereign is building state proofs and they are really focused on bridging between ZK rollups and uh, again back to the main uh, starting of this whole thing, which is privacy. I think still we are not there yet in terms of privacy using ZK proofs. We have seen Aztec try and ZK Connect, which was trying just to hide assets. Or do you, hide- why is privacy, is, is it primarily regulatory, do you think? Uh, or is it, is there, it's, or what, what, what are some of the yeah, reasons for privacy not being at scale? Okay. Obviously, after Tornado Cash, yeah. <laughs> it becomes a, a legal issue, right? Because people, if it's an open and permissionless, we are giving a tool for bad actors or malicious actors to launder money and like ransomware and stuff like that. So, but let's, let's get over this. Let's say that you are actually using a permission list of actors. You, after you validate the identity, you give them access to this private pool of capital. That can be done. And I still think like private ZK proofs are really st- still really hard. And that's what uh, I will just use a simple data point. Aztec itself. The vision for Aztec to begin with was to complete, to have a rollup, a ZK square rollup. A ZK square rollup means it's a ZK rollup. It's similar to everyone else, but it's also private. And the first iteration didn't work this way. Did, did, you, say, the, did you say ZK squared rollup? Yes. So privacy plus scalability, that's the squared. That's yes. what, what, what you mean by squared. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was a, it's how to have it was a hype term, actually, because the term is ZK. Term, I like it. Yeah, actually, like it, 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 it was like a couple of years back when they came out of the system. But with this goal, when they launched the various version, Aztec couldn't, couldn't do both. They could do some kind of it, which means that they could do scalability because they are ZK rollup. And on the privacy, they couldn't do much functionality. They just had transfers. I can transfer from my address to this address. That's it. You couldn't do much. You couldn't do programmable stuff. We're talking like ZK money or shielded transactions, right? ZK money, ZK dot money, yes, shielded transaction. You you couldn't do these things because the proof is too expensive or too long to generate. Because scalability is easier. Like the actually, it's okay. Let's do a disclosure. When we use the term ZK for scalability, that's abuse. Okay, that's overuse. Okay, scalability solutions have nothing to do with zero knowledge. They are just using the one element of this technology, which is called succinctness. You compress the stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But we are just using ZK for scalability now. Okay. Yeah. Just this disclosure. If you go out, if you want actual ZK, which means that you have to deal with private information and prove private details, this actually complicates the mass even further. And it makes it even harder to scale or mix this functionality. And it limits one important ex- uh, aspect. It limits programmability. Once you go to privacy, you can prove that I own this asset and I can transfer it. But it becomes way harder to have a global private state. What's a global private state? Let's assume that you have a, a Uniswap pool, right? A Uniswap pool is a shared state. All of us can see it and all of us can change it, right? By executing trades against the pool. The pool has some USDC, some, for example, and some ETH. Now we need to keep this private and then anyone can come and execute trade against this pool and change it. And this change has to be private. Now this becomes a way bigger problem. You are not just changing your own state, like payments. You are, you are changing a global state. And this is a bigger and more, a much complicated problem. There are like courageous team out there trying to solve this. Penumbra, like Renegade, Railgun, like there are people who are trying to do this, but it's still a harder problem. That's why if you want to create a ZK squared rollup, a rollup that is do both scalability and the privacy, it's a massive task. And that's why Aztec themselves said, we cannot do this while we are maintaining ZK money. So let's shut ZK money down and let's focus all our resources, all our team efforts into creating this new paradigm where we have this K ZK squared rollup. So privacy is still hard. That's why I still think it's not solved yet. No one has kind of figured it out yet. I've seen some uh, iterations of this for wallets. 
I forgot the name of the startup, but what they do is they take your assets and then they put it into some sort of like vault that has its own like assets where you can trade in and out of. Do you remember that startup? Uh, Which one was it? Nocturne. Yeah, Nocturne. So there are some interesting implementations of privacy, but I feel like that it it isn't like um, ZK native per se, like, you know, ZK money and, and others. It's more like using it as an off-chain type of compute. So it, it's not a coincidence that that the Zcash people have been talking about working on smart contracts on, uh, for for Zcash, but they never managed to to do it because it's really difficult. So far, they, yeah. they've only done zero knowledge proofs for basic transfers. Mm-hmm. But if you want to support smart contract functionality with privacy, has anyone done it? Aleo is working on it. Aleo is as another L1 private yeah. L1. Is that? Their goal is to allow both privacy and the programmability. So, like okay. you have private smart contract. But, but, but okay, so so Aleo is, is trying to do two of the three, which is privacy smart contract. But then previously, Aztec was trying to do three things, which is privacy smart contracts and scalability. Becoming and, a layer two, becoming yeah, becoming exactly. building on top of Ethereum. And by the way, building on Ethereum is an issue, me so on. Yep. That's why because. Because Ethereum uses account model, which is harder to deal with when you are doing privacy. That's why Zcash, and even, by the way, Aztec is a new direction. They are using a hybrid model, like UTXOs, or like the unspent transaction outputs model, which is used by Bitcoin, is more sim- similar to use when it comes to privacy. That's why, by the way, Zcash is also a UTXO-based system. Yeah. And many protocols that are attacking privacy are also trying to build on UTXO, but they create a hybrid that you have actually both systems, UTXO and account-based, and you can switch between both. And I think that is a direction that Findora tried first, and I think Aztec is trying to move in the same direction. So identity, scaling, and privacy. Is there anything else? Or should what we dive deeper want? into oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I think there were some, uh, we did talk about bridging a bit too. Like the only problem that ZK cannot solve is UX. So sorry, yeah. you cannot solve UX for you. But... For, for me, bridging is a special type of off-chain compute because yeah. you're, yeah. you're looking at a, a different chain, which by definition is off-chain from your chain, right? It, yeah. It, yeah. Like for me, ZK rollup, ZK ML in the case of modulus or ZK bridges, these are all special types of off-chain compute. I agree. Yeah. Z- ZK bridges are not, I think like it's pretty established now. Like there are ways to pass messages around, but the, the only problem with ZK bridges is that they're expensive, right? Because you Why? have to verify it. Because oh. you have to verify a, a ZK proof on, on each side. And, and if you don't batch enough transactions in there, then like you pay a big cost. And, and that's why like a lot of bridges now are still not using it, even though it's like the most secure way of doing it. It's just cheaper to not use ZK. Yeah. Yeah. Another special type of of a chain compute that I like, and I think it it may find actually application even outside Web3, is ZK functions. A ZK function is like when you define some computing that has to run, but you don't want to trust the operator. Like you don't want to trust AWS to run this function for you or trust Azure or whatever. So you give them the code to run and they run it for you and they give the output of the function with a proof that the function has been run correctly. So I think the concept of ZK functions, of course, it will find the application first in Web3, but I think the concept in general can be generalized to Web2 once we overcome the computational overhead problem. But this is, uh, what you said here is, it feels fundamentally at odds with what David said earlier, which is that ZK proofs are extremely specialized. But you're saying you, you can take any generic Fuda, you're saying you can take any generic function and, and do a generic proof on it. it no. Here is a trick. Yeah. You, now yeah. you can. You go, David, if you want to answer this, go for it. So the way I understand your question is that, yes, it is possible. Like Fuda is correct that it is possible but to optimize like very specific applications of it to make it practical. It's, very, it's still very specialized. It depends on what you want to do. Yeah. So if you just want like generalized things, then you're going to get that 100 million, you know, that 100 million X uh, um, factor. Factor. <laughs> yeah. So let me actually answer this more detailed. Okay. You can today run any function and create a ZK proof for it. 
And the trick here is that you don't create a specific circuit for this function. Instead, you go and build a virtual machine and you implement the circuit that executes the virtual machine. So we call it ZKVM. And mm -hmm. this is a bigger umbrella that under it, you have ZK EVM. When you mm -hmm. have this virtual machine is specific to be compatible with the EVM. Mm -hmm. So there are so many projects today that actually offer you a generalized ZK VM. Mm -hmm. You have ZK WASM, you have obviously ZK VM, and even Risk Zero, which is a, a startup in this domain, they are creating a technology where you can write any code that complies to a certain architecture in computer architecture called Risk Five. Mm -hmm. Risk Five is, is just a certain architecture that you can compile programs to, and if you can write it to Risk Five, they will take this code and create a proof for it using by building a ZK VM for risk zero, for, sorry, for risk five architecture. So the concept of ZK VM is very, very powerful because it implements a base computational layer that you can go and build any code on top of it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, because of this ease of use, that it's very, very generic, anyone can use it, but it's not optimized. It can be, as David mentioned, it can be a hundred to a thousand X worse than going and implementing a specialized ZK circuit to do this functionality. And fundamentally, there is a motivation for this because there is a motivation for general ZK VM because the EVM is very unfriendly to zero knowledge proofs. It makes proving and, and verif verification very expensive. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, very unfriendly that the most performant ZK rollups are not implementing ZK VM. Uh, sorry, ZK EVM natively, they went and built a different circuit completely that is not necessarily compatible with EVM, and they just use a translator layer or a translation layer to accept Solidity code. So for the developer point, from the developer point of view, the developer doesn't know anything but writing the same Solidity code, and it runs both on Ethereum native and on ZK Sync, for example. But ZK Sync era. In reality, it's not ZK, ZK, EV, ZK EVM compatible. Vitalik uses a term for that, which we use often between us, which is type 4 ZK EVM. And you're talking about the different equivalencies, right? Yeah, that's a, like the topic of equivalency to how much are you compatible or natively compatible to the ZK EVM architecture. And some people are building that scroll, for example, like saying, no, we want to be ZK EV equivalent, uh, not compatible. Like we want to be exactly like EVM. Other projects like StarkNet and ZK Sync Era are not natively compatible to like uh, EVM. They build their own circuit and just they are just trying to make it easy for developers to use this uh, Solidity, the same code. They don't they don't want the developers to go and write new code. Of course, ZK Sync succeeded in that. StarkNet is still trying because they have their own language, which is Cairo. And then Polygon ZK EVM. Polygon ZK EVM is also uses a trick to convert, but it's uh, it's in the, it's in between. It's not completely ZK yeah. Sync era style or scroll style. Mm -hmm. Fuda, so a, a few months ago, we, we wrote about a bunch of uh, applications of ZK. I think we should critique it, knowing what we know today, in terms of what is exactly realistic and practical today. Do you want to go through mm -hmm. some of the ideas? Some of the ideas that I had with ZK ML, it's not ZK ML in the sense of that we Modulus is doing. Modulus is building something that is very specific to Web3 that if you want to do a functionality using machine learning as off-chain compute, you can do it off-chain compute and verify it on a chain. Is that suitable for maybe smaller models? Maybe models that in the tens of millions of parameters, not billions yet. One of the ideas that I had is that this concept can actually scale to Web2, which means that now you connect to a chat GBT, or you, ch you connect to OpenAI to run ChatGPT, and you trust OpenAI. Whatever output you come, you give you, you, you trust, you trust them that they have run GBT4 at the back end or GBT3.5 Turbo or whatever model they said they run for you. You have to trust them. You have no way to other than to trust them. Like one idea that I had that possibly in the future we can actually have OpenAI give you the output of the model along with a proof that they actually have run the model for you. But given what we know now that we're still limited by the computation and like this five to eight orders of magnitude complexity, I don't think this is going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, I can give some colors on that front. So I heard about a project called uh, 
Ezekiel, but it's written E Z K L. Mm -hmm. Like easy zero knowledge proof in ML. Wow. Anyways, E Z K L. Anyways, um, and they're like at the at the bleeding edge of trying to put ML into zk proofs, and the approximate size that they seem to be at right now is like 2016 size ML models. So you can run run some GANs, you can run some simple like convolutional networks like that in in zk and prove like the input or at the output or you know hide the hide the weights and stuff like that. But that's like bleeding edge stuff. You can you can try to use that software. If you get stuck, you'll have to like message the the guy who's working on it, right? The prof that's working on it. Wait, hold on. So in in that case, what is exactly the use case? What do you prove? There's a few things you can do. You can prove that something has run according to the the algo that you wrote. So that's like the validity proof, right? You can like offset the comp compute. Somebody does it and then returns you the the result, and then you can verify that the result was not tampered with. Mm -hmm. So that's like not zero knowledge, but it's like uh, verifiable. Verifiable, yeah. You can also uh, hide the input and say, "I have a picture of a hot dog. I'm gonna have to, gonna show you the picture of the hot dog, but I can prove to you that it's a picture of hot dog according to this neural net, right?" <laughs> Is that uh, is that useful? Uh, okay, yes. maybe not. Let's, I think let's that's take a, no, no. Time. I think that's extremely useful. I don't know what it is. Hold on, I'm trying to think. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to sell you nudes. I'm trying to sell you nudes. <laughs> it, it, it can be useful. No, exactly. Yeah. I, like I have a piece of information. I'm not going to tell you what what it is. I, I know some piece of information that's really important about the world. Yeah. About what Putin wants to do next or something, and then I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I can prove to you. That this will happen, I mean that's that feels extremely powerful. Yes, yes, yes. Blackmailing. <laughs> Black yeah, mail. like that is only that is the only use case that can come to mind. Like, I saw you like doing something you shouldn't be doing, so and I have a proof of it, so, <laughs> and I will not show it to you, but you know what you were doing, something like that. Yeah. Or like, if you have a piece of information you want to sell to a journalist, but you don't trust the other person, the, the two people don't, the two counterparties don't trust each other, and you want money first. Well, if the journalist also doesn't trust you, how, why would they give you money for your information? Well, you can prove to the journalist that you, you're in the possession of that information. Yeah. And then they give mm -hmm. you money, in, and then in, in exchange, you give them the, the information. Mm -hmm. yeah. For example. I think the complexity here is that the model has to be trained on a specific kind of information. Like if it's a computer vision model, it has to be trained for that. If it's like text-based yeah. like information, it has to be like... It, the complexity here is in more in the machine learning side, and for each machine learning model, you will have to have its own specialized circuit to be efficient. So I think that is like still hard. Yeah. So so EZKL translates PyTorch models into zk circuits. That's like the goal. Mm. That becomes general. It's similar to the zk VM analogy. PyTorch is a kind of a basis for it's, anyone who touches AI. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's general because yeah. it's, it's all about matrix multiplication. So EZKL will have done a lot of optimizations for matrix, like recursive matrix multiplications. Mm -hmm. And the way they do that, I don't know, but like it's specialized for ML. I, I don't think they will have enough 100% coverage of all the functions or methods in PyTorch, but if, he, if they can get to the majority of them, Mm -hmm. The stuff that can be used to describe like convolutional neural networks or something like that. I think they will cover actually pretty big ground yeah. of the machine learning models that can be implemented. That's interesting. I didn't I didn't look into that before, so that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, and this is completely orthogonal to, to blockchain. Like this has nothing to do with, with the blockchain. This is just pure yeah. ZK stuff. Yeah. But they are, they are very, very, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. they're very complementary, but we can talk about like non blockchain. Things, right? Um, yeah, number of I think I think uh, one of the ideas that I still believe it's doable today and not very complicated, but no one is doing it for some reason. It authenticity of transformations of videos or images or stuff like that. That we agree that we can prove a video or the authenticity of a video or a picture by digital signature, right? You create this podcast episode after it's edited. You Imran or you Chow take the full video, create a hash for the video. 
you sign it from your wallet, that was a video authentic. Now, what if I want just take one minute clip of this video and want to prove that this one minute video is indeed a subset of the original authentic video? There is no way to do this now. And I don't think the transformation or the code to do this transformation is so complex that it cannot be proven with ZK. But so far, I have seen very few projects that are trying to do this, whether it's for audio or video or images. So, but I think this is still a low hanging fruit and it has massive use cases within Web3 and outside Web3. It's actually a Web2 use case, but mm -hmm. no one is doing it that yet. <laughs> yeah, that, that does seem like a lot of uh, research work. Um, mm -hmm. So that's like for media, right? So mm -hmm. let me give you an example of the same thing you said, but like for something else, right? Um, emails are signed and they're like, and if you trust the sign, like the, the, the signature that came from some, uh, some DNS server is valid, then you can, you can create a ZK proof about this email that you got and say something that is truthful and, and people will believe you. So another example of the, of the network thing, you can have your bank send you a statement of your, of your, uh, your net worth, create a ZK proof hiding the actual net worth hiding maybe some other details that you don't want to see. But the other person that receives this proof will see that, oh, Bank of America has signed this message and like at line, you know, uh, three, this number that's, uh, it, it was like larger than a million, right? So like that's with email. Another thing you can do is uh, like theoretically is have a ZK browser where Everything that you receive from the web, like web pages and stuff are signed. And you could take all that data and generate like statements about things that you see on the web. So you can like lock, like if, if your, if your bank doesn't send you uh, statements about your, your, your thing, because like it, you know, it's unsecure, you could log into the bank website and from, from the, the HTTP requests, you could technically like find a subset of that, turn it into a ZK proof about whatever you want to say about yourself. Right? You could say you own, you're the owner of, uh, of this Anon account on Twitter. You can say things about your, your bank statement. You can you know, do whatever. I just so, want to be able to do all that QIC bullshit without having to download my bank statement every single time yeah. and, and reveal yeah. the money in my bank. Right. Or, or even something like Blad. Like Blad is like, has to get connection to your bank account and see all, and you have the ability to see all your transactions, whatever you spend, just to get one information, which is a balance, because they want to do this deposit just by the balance. So like, can we have a company that creates a, a ZK blad that they only will get access to this piece of information? They don't see your whole transaction history by getting access to your bank account. <laughs> so the thing here is that, is that you do not need a plaid to prove about things like that anymore. Uh, once the ZK infrastructure has been built, you can go and browse it yourself and create these ZK proofs. You're like eliminating the, the trusted party in the, in the middle. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's right. Makes perfect sense, yeah. actually. Yeah. And also, once you have generated this proof, like this proof exists on its own. Like you don't need anybody to, to serve this proof or anything like that. You're like it's a piece of document that can convince anybody of the statement that you're, that you made. You don't need like a API to query. You don't need anything like that. So you can imagine it as like these pieces of information kind of floating around the web, having truth statements about the world. Yeah. And this kind of proofs have an element of privacy as well, because these proofs are verifiable as is, right? As a standalone proofs. You don't need input on them. Like they are, if they are true, then you prove something and that's it. So this is a very powerful concept. Um, I think it has a name for it, right, uh, David? Like, uh, what um, is it? Well, uh, it doesn't have a name yet, but there is a project that is working on trying to standardize the, the, the production and, and distribution of these proofs so that people can plug into this system more easily. It's like, like a protocol for, for people to work together with these proofs more easily. And they call it the uh, proof carrying data, a PCD. And it's another uh, Xerox Park endeavor. So I think the use cases for, for this PCD is that they have way more use cases in Web2 in general than any, in, than even Web3 because you, you can use it in everyday life, right? You can use a QIC, financial transaction. There is a lot of use cases here.
you can use it for Tinder, for high rituals, <laughs> idea as well. So I guess closing it out, there are you know, an incredible amount of startups that can be built on some of the infrastructure that's being built with ZK. It seems like we're still in the early phases, right? Because proving times take, you know, let's say 40 seconds and uh, the infrastructure is still being built out from a, uh, like a developer perspective, right? Yeah, um, I would say so, that, like, yeah. although, although it is still, uh, you know, performance is still a problem, like it is possible for developers to come in and do something like proof of concepts. Yeah. And once yeah. you have proof of concepts, you can go and talk to someone that's more specialized than you and they will work with you to, to optimize your circuits or anything like that. So the door is opening and now is the time to experiment. Nice. Well, um, any uh, other final thoughts before we uh, close out? I have a thought that like, uh, and it comes back to my question to David, that like ZK is a native Web3 technology, right? The concept of Web3 is that like you minimize trust between parties. And the first version for that was actually blockchain. And it seems that many people are like just tying the Web3 sector or this kind of technologies to blockchain. If it's if it doesn't blockchain, it doesn't use crypto or something like that. And I disagree with that. I think ZK is a prime example of this trend of Web3 that actually have way more implications outside Web3. And if nothing comes from the Web3 other than the ZK technology and that this sector has actually given birth and promoted developed this technology to the world, I would be happy with what Web3 have achieved. <laughs> I still have high hopes beyond that, but kind of ZK is our is gift, Web3 gift to the world, essentially. So this is kind of my high level thoughts. I like it because it's less grifty than blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. This is like, this sentence can be unpacked for a whole episode. Why, <laughs> why do you feel this way, David? So I mean, like blockchains made it very easy to every, anybody to launch a coin and to uh, attract investors or you know people who are hoping for a i'm sure zk will allow many people to launch a coin as well like <laughs> it's nice it's that easy but for next time <laughs> so I, I feel that we have a lot more to say but like we are limited by time like uh like, I, I feel like one and a half hours is still too little to discuss zk <laughs> so we need to do more episodes than zk agreed well uh ciao any final thoughts i just think Polynomials and primes are great. They're the most beautiful things in the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of a miracle that this has happened, but you know. Great. For founders that are looking to um, learn more, feel free to check out our crypto ideas site on alliance.xyz. Otherwise, we'll see you guys in the next episode. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Good Game. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you next week.